All right, now that's finally working. Gotta love YouTube. All right, guys, welcome to April 23rd, when this is our third live stream session, still on lockdown. Looks like it's gonna be that way for a little bit longer. So we're going to jump into it today, kicking it off with a few questions uh, from last week's session, uh, a few questions we weren't able to get to, and then we will go ahead and jump into any new questions you guys have. You can at any point go ahead and leave your questions right in that live stream feed. You can uh, watch this at learn.flightmikealpha.com or here on YouTube. Either way, works out. So uh, yes, of course, uh, we will be tearing open that uh, seized up engine to examine exactly what went wrong. Actually, before we do that, we're going to try to run it again, and that video will be on flightmikealpha.com. So if you guys did not already see the uh, video from this morning of what happens uh, and basically uh, how long your engine can run without oil pressure, what happens when all the oil is drained from your engine. Well, that's what we uh, that's what we streamed live for you this morning or did the premiere. Uh, so pretty, uh, pretty interesting how long that thing ran for. It actually ran for about 17 minutes, uh, which was a lot longer than, you know, I had ever expected. <laughs> I thought 30 seconds a minute, something. Um, but this thing actually ran for a really long time. So if you guys have not already checked out that video, then definitely do so. I'll go ahead and share that link with you guys in here. Uh, but uh, a few little housekeeping issues from last week. First, we'll jump into uh, the questions we had remaining. First one was descent planning. Uh, and uh, yeah, if you found out that you ran your new car without oil on the dipstick for a while, that's not good. Um, yeah, and... If it can be started again, that's what we'll find out when we uh, when we do that next video. We put up a lot more videos from this series, from the Cherokee series on Flight Mike Alpha that won't go here on YouTube. Uh, they'll be there for anyone with any sort of membership. Doesn't matter what membership level you have on Flight Mike Alpha, but uh, there'll be about a hundred videos tearing through this airplane. What's inside the wings? What's inside the engine? All the systems behind the panel, all that stuff will be up on Flight Mike Alpha. So first things first, descent planning. Let's go ahead and look at an approach here into Sarasota Airport. We'll pull up an ILS, uh, which is pretty easy here. Let's see. We've got an ILS for runway 32 should work. Make that a little bigger. Hopefully you guys can see that. If you can't, let me know. Uh, but what we're looking at here, really, for this ILS into runway 32 is uh, we'd be coming in here outside of Ringy, so outside of Ringy, over in this area, we'd be coming in at 1,800 feet, and we would hit our final approach fix. Of course, in the ILS, the final approach fix is actually where you intercept the glide slope, but if you're at 1,800 feet, well, it should happen right around Ringy, they're saying, and then you'll start on down. How quickly do we descend? That is the question, right? That is the million-dollar question. So uh, without that picture there, let's get rid of that and see if we can get ourselves a nice little white canvas here to type on for you guys. Make this a little bit bigger. Well, descent planning, all right? So based on we want to come down, say we're flying at, uh, oh, we'll look at the GPS. We notice our ground speed's about, I don't know, maybe 80 knots, right? So ground speed is 80 knots as we're on final approach. So as we're coming in here at uh, just outside of Ringy, we're flying at 80 knots ground speed. And when we hit the glide slope, all we're gonna do is just reduce power a little bit and start descending. We're not gonna change configuration of the aircraft. The gear should already be down. The flap should already be set. We're just gonna follow down the glide path. So ground speed should stay pretty consistent. Only thing that's gonna change, of course, maybe is the winds aloft as we descend, but not drastically, right? So if we have a ground speed of 80 knots, well, then we wanna do some simple math here. That simple math is add a zero, okay? So 80, we're gonna add a zero, we get 800. Now let's go ahead and divide that by two, all right, and what do we get when we divide by two? Well, we get 400, okay? That's your descent rate, all right, 400 feet per minute, okay? Now that works because that's giving you a three degree glide path, all right? So this is all based on having a three degree glide path. If I can remember that little thing there, three degree glide slope. So got a three degree glide slope and we can look here and we can say, okay, yeah, in fact, that's what we have on this ILS approach here. That's pretty simple, three degree glide path. So if we descend at 400 feet per minute, starting at Ringy, we will come down at right on glide path and we'll be fine. Now, 
if we notice that we're just a little bit above glide path or a little bit below it, we could adjust 50 feet a minute, 100 feet a minute, something like that. If we change our ground speed, of course, if we're in a jet and we're doing this a little bit faster, so uh, when I used to be in the airline, we'd approach, maybe we'd have a ground speed of about like say 130 knots. All right, so nothing crazy. So ground speed is going to be 130 knots. Remember the difference between ground speed and glide slope. I guess we should probably specify that, right? So we're gonna go ahead and fix that up for you guys. Three degree glide slope, not ground speed. And so if we have 130 knot ground speed, really simple, 130, add a zero. All right, then we go ahead and divide by two. And once we divide by two, we say, okay, well that equals, what is that, about 650 feet per minute. And guess what, we were always flying about 650, 700 feet per minute down, you know, going through a thousand feet, we always heard stable sink seven, you know, or whatever it was. So um, that was a very typical call out we would announce to, uh, from the pilot monitoring to the pilot flying in the airlines, because we were always coming down at about 700 feet a minute on the VSI is what that thing was telling us. Um, because if you're doing 130 knots over the ground, you got to maintain about 650 feet per minute to come down on glide path. Now, from a descent planning perspective of, hey, I'm going to be, you know, right now I'm, I don't know, say 20 miles from Ringy, and I need to be at 1,800 feet, and I'm up here at 7,000 feet. So I've got, if I've got uh, 7,000 feet, you know, and I got to be down at 1,800, well, 7,000 minus 1,800, how many feet do you have to lose? Well, you've got about 5,200 feet to lose, right? So 5,200 feet is how much you have to lose. Just simple uh, subtraction there, right? So 5,200 feet, we like to say three nautical miles per thousand feet. So all we're gonna do per thousand feet, 5.2 times three, guess what? That comes out to about, let's just do easy math here, guys. 15 miles out, we need to start down. And how fast do we need to come down at if we start 15 miles out descending? then we will be at 1,800 feet at Ringy. If we wanna be at 1,800 feet, say two or three miles prior to Ringy, well then we have to go ahead and account for that. So we're gonna say 15 miles out plus three miles prior. So now 18 miles prior, we need to start descending. So that way, three miles prior to Ringy, three miles prior to getting here, when we're out here, we'll be at 1,800 feet. That's where we'd like to be because we'd like to be stabilized, right? So then in that case, 18 miles out, we need to start coming down, but how quickly do we need to start coming down? Well, again, what's your ground speed? No, well, maybe your ground speed is, say, 100 knots out there, okay? 100 knot ground speed. Well, again, simple, easy math here, guys. We're gonna take the 100, we're gonna go ahead and add a zero, we're gonna go ahead and divide that by two, and guess what? It is 500 feet per minute. So come down 500 feet per minute, and that will work out for you. You will be at 1,800 feet, and if you start at 18 miles out, well then th you'll be three miles prior to Ringy at 1800 feet, right where you wanna be. So that is the simple descent planning, as simple as I can make it for you guys. The nice easy round math that we use when we're doing instrument training, or even for private pilots or commercial pilots, anytime you're planning a descent, that's how it's done, regardless of if you're IFR or uh, if you're flying VFR. Thank you, Marcus, for uh, donating, that's awesome. Uh, and let's see here, is there a glide slope that's ideal for passengers? Just out of curiosity, that's a great question, MH, uh, whatever MH stands for. Um, that is an excellent question because here, let's go ahead and think about it this way, right? So let's go ahead and just get ourselves a little new uh, sheet to start with here. So let's say you're flying that awesome new Mooney you got, right? And you got a tailwind. So your ground speed, you know, maybe your airspeed's like 150 knots and you've got a tailwind of 30 knots. So now you're doing 180 knots over the ground. That is smoking, awesome. So you're doing 180 knots. And you're like, hey, I need to come down from 7,000 feet down to 2,000 feet. And so I got 5,000 feet to lose, so I should do this 15 miles out. And what descent rate do I need to use? Well, you simply take that 180, you add a zero, you go ahead and divide by two, and what do you get? You get 900 feet per minute. Well, guess what? Your Mooney is not pressurized, and 900 feet a minute is a little bit aggressive on the eardrums. So what are we gonna do in this case? All right, well, real easy. We're just gonna do it half. So instead of a three degree glide slope, this whole problem here is based on a three degree glide slope, let's base it on a 1.5 degree glide slope. Let's use 450 feet per minute. All right, so now it's half of that. What are we gonna have to do as far as our distance? Well, if we're gonna say, hey, we got 5,000 feet to lose, so we're gonna do that 15 miles out, well, now we're gonna have to come down here and say, okay, it was 15 miles, now we just need to start 30 nautical miles out, double that, 
and we can have that. So if you want to half your descent rate, if 900 feet per minute is too aggressive because you're not pressurized, it's going to hurt people's eardrums, no problem at all, then just simply divide it by two. Again, you get 450, so you half it, that's pretty easy on the eardrums, and then double your distance to start. So instead of 15 miles out for 5,000 feet, now we're going to be doing it 30 miles out for the 5,000 feet. So instead of the distance times three, it's distance times six. All right, so pretty simple math there. That will really help the eardrums of your passengers. Um, but that is a great question. That certainly as you get into flying more advanced aircraft or, you know, just flying with the tailwind, uh, that becomes a little bit more uh, prevalent. Marie asked, how come you add a zero to the 80 and 130? Sorry, I'm new to aviation. Not a problem, Marie. That is just um, how this math problem works, right? So we were trying to find out what descent rate we want to use and... Uh, how many feet per minute we need to come down at, so what our descent rate is and what our descent distance should be, how many miles prior uh, to a certain area that we want to be at should we start our descent, and that's just how the math works out on this, right? So based on your ground speed, nautical miles, etc., etc., whatever, adding the zero and then dividing by two makes the math work out to give you those answers. So uh, that keeps it nice and simple for us. Uh, the reason for this, of course, is Marie, because airplanes are not like helicopters, they don't actually come down that easy. People think airplanes fall out of the sky. They simply don't. It's very difficult to make airplanes descend, and oftentimes in our slippery airplanes like Moonies, our more advanced aircraft, they can uh, get going too fast, and we can overspeed the airplane. Even when we pull power idle, we can shut off the engine, and the airplane could be going too fast because we're trying to descend too rapidly, so we want to plan out our descents, and also it's good for engine management, so we don't shock cool our engines or hurt our engines by making them run really hard and then making them not run at all, um, you know, or pulling the power back and not producing a lot of heat. So uh, Doc asked, would those questions uh, be on a prior pilot written? Not so much, I think they should be. Uh, definitely uh, you'll be thinking about those for your instrument written, uh, commercial, CFI, AGI, not direct questions like that, but the math applies. You'll wanna know how that math works out. Um, it is a great rule of thumb. Uh, and yeah, certainly the greater your ground speed, either the, uh, the faster you're going to need to come down to maintain that three degree angle, the steeper or the faster descent rate, or you're going to have to start further out, uh, if you don't want to increase that descent rate. So it's just a simple, uh, really it's a triangle problem. If you think about it, you know, it's a three degree triangle problem is what we're doing, uh, trying to keep it nice and shallow. So, uh, that was uh, left over from last uh, week. Now, the next one we've got here is a uh, commercial check ride for uh, John Riley from Hastings Air. And anything I should study extra? Well, aside from the commercial pilot boot camp on Flight Mike Alpha, if you do that, I think you should be in pretty good shape. That course takes you through all the maneuvers, takes you through all the example orals. Um, definitely be up to speed on your systems. Read your POH for the airplane you're bringing on that day of your check ride. Definitely read that POH and read through the commercial pilot ACS so you're familiar with what's going to be asked of you. Make sure that your CFI actually did everything. So it's sometimes it's easy for CFIs if they haven't had a commercial pilot student in a while to forget about doing things like accelerated stalls um, or steep spirals or things like that with their students uh, in preparation for a commercial check ride. I've had some commercial students where we fly two days, three days, and I send them for a check ride. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a lot to do in two or three days, so it's easy to miss something or not be up to speed on something. So definitely take the time to read through that uh, POH and read through uh, the ACS as well and definitely go through the commercial pilot boot camp at Flight Mike Alpha because, well, of course, you know, we built it. We think it's really good. And... Students have had incredible success with it, passing their check rides. So I would definitely recommend that to you. Um, my ex-wife trashed my logbook, and I'd like to get back into flying. What do I do? Um, well, for starters, find a wife that likes flying um, that won't trash your logbook. Um, sorry, Chris, that is terrible. Um, now it comes to the question of do you have, what kind of other supporting records do you have for your logbook, right? So do you have pictures of it on your cell phone, on Google Photos or in iPhotos or whatever? Do you have any receipts from the flight school? Uh, do you have your flight instructor's contact information and did he log those flights in his logbook? Would he be able to take his logbook and rebuild your logbook out of that? Uh, would you be able to take the receipts uh, or any sort of online records from the flight school you trained at 
and rebuild your logbook from that. Would you be, do you have any pictures or any scanned copies of your logbook? Can you rebuild your logbook from that? If the answer is no and you have absolutely nothing and no records, then the flight time never happened, um, which is terrible. Um, it's really, really a bummer. Um, but in all reality, there's usually something in that category, right? Either scanned copies, photographs of the logbook, your instructor's logbook, records from the flight school, records your instructor might have kept, records for the airplane, something, a scheduling software that had records, any of those things should have uh, some sort of record that you could rebuild the logbook. And then when you do rebuild your logbook, also get an electronic logbook and always keep them in series, right? Uh, whether even if you're just using Excel as you know, an Excel file, keeping a record of your logbook that way, as long as there's a record, it's fine. Um, that record just needs to be signed by you when you're PIC and signed by your instructor when they are PIC. Uh, when you're not able to access PIC for it to be valid. Um, you can always rebuild it and have the, get the signatures back in there, and then it becomes valid again. Just track down your old CFI. So uh, the rule of thumb that we talked about earlier, Leandro, uh, is the descent rule of thumb. So the ground speed at a zero divided by two to find out your descent rate in feet per minute for a 3-degree glide slope, and then your thousands of feet to lose. So you need to lose 3,000 feet, need to lose 5,000 feet, multiply that by three, and that gives you your distance to start prior in nautical miles. So how many miles prior to a fix or to an airport do I need to start descending to be at a certain altitude? Well, then you just multiply the number of thousands of feet you have to lose by three. That's how many miles, nautical miles prior you need to start if you're using that three degree descent formula of ground speed and knots at a zero divided by two. That gives you your feet per minute to descend at. So, uh, Prince, I passed my CFI and CFII because of Flat Mike Alpha. That is awesome. Thank you, man. Glad to hear that. Definitely send your students over to the website, and we actually have our CFI course up on the website now. CFII course will be coming out soon here, uh, probably into May, uh, possibly June, just depending on how long this craziness keeps going for. Uh, so, let's see if I've missed any questions. Um... Uh, Definitely put them back in because it's sometimes hard to keep up with all of these uh, little questions coming through this feed here. I know I saw something here. It says Ames as 500 feet should be the traffic pattern altitude for helicopters. Does this apply for L all helicopters, including large and fast ones too? It should seem better that everyone stays at the same TPA. Well, yes and no. It's designed for a reason that way. Um, so if you look at... The advisory circular that escapes me right now. What is it? It's AC 90-43, is it? Um, there's one that uh, deals with uh, non-towered airports. AC 90 non-towered airports. Uh, and 90-66 Bravo is the one. Um, that lays things out really well. So does the aim. If you follow that, it all works. I know things might seem better. Some people are like, oh, circular traffic patterns would be better, or this would be better, or that, or whatever. No, the way things are laid out here in 90-66 Bravo and the AIM works really well. Um, and keeping helicopters a little bit lower, uh, they're typically a little bit slower. There's uh, Most helicopters are not flying, although some helicopters are faster. You know, there's helicopters that do 120, 130 knots, you know, pretty easily. But they don't fly those speeds when they're coming into land, you know, like airplanes do. Airplanes fly, you know, their you know, approach speed, you know, 80, 90, 100 knots you know, in the traffic pattern. Helicopters are typically a lot slower than that, so it makes sense to keep them down low. Otherwise, we'd be plowing into them. Mid-airs between helicopters and airplanes, never a good thing. Um, so uh, that is really um, why that's kind of set up there. Helicopters, when you see them coming into land, they're always going to be approaching at 20, 30 knots, 40 knots, you know, and then slow into there. And then eventually, they come to zero knots when they touch down. Um, they're going very slow. So that's uh, why things are set up that way. It works out pretty well in the end. Um... But thank you for the question. Makes sense. And uh, Emmanuel, I'm on the path to getting my private. Emmanuel was the guy who actually guessed closest to how long that engine was going to run earlier today. He said 15 minutes. He was the best guess on uh, how long that um, engine was going to run for for the uh, engine without oil on our uh, YouTube channel that we posted up earlier today. And uh, Emmanuel says, I'm on the path to getting my private. Uh, what do you recommend? Study and getting my FA written first, then go ahead with the flying part or just study uh, or just start flying and slash study with a CFI. And here's the problem with the starting to fly and then study with the CFI. Flying is a lot more fun than studying, so we tend to do a lot more of that. Also, it costs a lot more money. And despite the fact that you're blowing through money like crazy, you'll be very tempted to keep spending the money 
and having that CFI catch you up on all the things that you should already know because you haven't really gone through the ground school yet as much as you should have, and the CFI will be more than happy to catch you up at a good rate of 50 to 60 to maybe even $100 per hour. That's expensive. Uh, you could go through our entire prior pilot ground school in about mm, two to three weeks if you're really motivated, and it costs $39 per month. $39 for one month, a lot cheaper than 60 bucks per hour times many, many hours. Uh, I highly recommend going through that ground school, getting the written totally done before you set foot in an aircraft. If you are too eager and you just want to get into an airplane, I totally understand I was too. Uh, then in that case, go through at least half of that ground school, if not more. Try to get through the whole ground school before getting in the airplane. If you don't have the written done yet, that's okay, but get the written done within the first two, three, four lessons with your CFI. Do not let it delay or just kind of drag out. Make sure you uh, you get through that ground school as much as possible before getting in the airplane. That will save you a lot of time and money and frustration when you're in the aircraft. And then definitely get the written knocked out very early on in flight training. Make sure you have that written done before you solo. It will save you a lot of time and money. How much? Two to three thousand dollars in the grand scheme of things. That's a good chunk of change. Two to three thousand dollars you can put towards flying for fun later on without the CFI on board after you get your private uh, and of course everybody could save a little bit of cash right now, right? So, uh, getting the ground school done, really important. It is pretty cheap. You can do the free one, uh, on flight Mike Alpha, which will prepare you for quite a bit. Won't prepare you for the written necessarily, but will prepare you a lot for flight training. And then our premium ground school, it's 39 bucks a month. It's not a lot of money on the website there. So, uh, next question we got, uh, Omar, 31 years old and $20,000 international student. How can I start flying in the USA? Do I need the full 45 to 50K? So I'm not totally sure what you mean by that, Omar, if you've got 20,000 saved up um, or what exactly that means. Uh, flight training in the United States, zero to commercial, anywhere from $30,000 on the very, very, very low end on up to $100,000. Why the huge difference? You pay different rates for instructors, different rates for airplanes, different fees at different schools. Uh, fuel at some airports is $9 per gallon. At some airports, it's two sixty dollars per gallon. It just all depends what airplane you're using, what school you're going to, where you're going. It's the same license at the end of the day. Um, so whether you go to you know Harvard Medical School or you go to you know, online, whatever medical school, college that no one's ever heard of, it's all okay. And you're still a doctor at the end of the day, still going to be a commercial pilot at the end of the day. Is $20,000 enough to get through to commercial pilot in the United States? Eh, you're going to have to take out some loans because um, it's not going to get you all the way through. Uh, how can you start flying? Well, you can go to one of those 141 schools that gives you a visa uh, to come here and flight train because I couldn't let you come train here because uh, I'm not a 141 flight school. Uh, so I can't issue a visa for you to come into the country and do flight training. Unfortunately, um, those flight schools are, yeah, every bit of 40 to 50 to $100,000, depending on which one you go to. So $20,000 saved up, it's going to it's gonna take a little bit more. Um to get all the way through to commercial doing it here. Although the United States is the cheapest country in the world to do it in. Uh, so our fuel's cheaper, our airplanes are cheaper, instructors are cheaper, everything's cheaper here. There's no airway fee, uh, airway fees or anything like that. Uh, there's no approach fees, very few airport fees. So still the best place to train, but you know, it costs money. I mean, we've all paid it. Uh, that's how I got to be a CFI. Just, you know, lots of time and money. It's all it takes, right? Uh, so Jeffrey is doing the ground school now and going to get the written test done the first week of June. That is an awesome goal. And then flying time is an excellent plan, Jeffrey. Uh, definitely stick with that and try to get that written done before you hop in the airplane. Marie, what tips do you have for those new to aviation or those still in high school who are looking into aviation as a career? Well, Marie, uh, just absorb everything you can. You're in the right place. You're poking around on YouTube. Watch a lot of videos. Learn a lot of stuff. Hang out around your local airport. Take a ground school, take as many online courses as you can, take advantage of free courses like we have at Flight Mike Alpha. There's a lot of information on there for free. Um, and get as much information as you had as you possibly can. Uh, then private pilot's where you start, right? You know, that's where everybody has to start. Get your private pilot license, keep going through there. Take every opportunity you can, seize every opportunity you can, become a drone pilot, get that certification, become a CFI, do all those different things. Get as many certifications as you can, build your resume, and you will have a career in aviation. 
the best advice I have is put as much information in your head as you can. It never hurts. You should always be learning more. And uh, definitely just take advantage of every opportunity you can. Be, be eager, be aggressive, don't be lazy. Uh, if you have time to sit around and watch TV or watch Netflix, then you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. You should be 100% focused on building your resume and building your aviation career and building up your knowledge. Uh, next question, Johnny Sprague. How fast do you think a motivated person with a full-time job can get through your instrument ground school? Hmm, well, about 40 to 50 hours of work to get through that course. Uh, so, motivated person with a full-time job, spending, you know, reasonably, you know, two hours per day, five days per week, a month, you know, could reasonably get through it. And we're seeing, you know, typically a month to sometimes three months to get through it. Um, but that would be a, a realistic estimate for you. Uh, if you try to blast through things too quickly, it's just, you know, a fact of how our brains work. You don't always absorb as much. So doing it eight hours, 10 hours a day, not necessarily a great thing trying to get it knocked out in like five days, you know. Uh, so spreading it out over the course of a month, pretty good plan for you, Johnny. Uh, let's see here. Shout out to the free ground school. Not sure I would have committed to spending money right away. That's a good thing. That's what it's there for. If you are all curious about aviation, don't know where to begin, take the free ground school. It will take you about 35 to 40 hours to go through that course. It's free. You don't have to log in. don't have to do anything to access it. You just have to take the time and study. And if you get through that and you're still really excited about aviation, then you should definitely become a pilot. If you think it's boring and a lot of work, then... Uh, I don't know, do something else. Um, what is the uh, best written test online prep school? Well, of course, ours, Jorge. Uh, FlyMyCalf.com would be the best one. That's what I think. That's why we built it. We looked at everybody else's. I didn't really like them using them with my students, so I built a different one, and we think it's the best. But that being said, there's a lot out there. You can find them on Google. You can try them all out. Uh, you can try out ours. You can look at the free course and see how we lay that out if you like the free course then the one that costs 39 bucks a month is pretty affordable and uh, is guaranteed to help you pass that written exam. So if you take that course and you pass it, and we'll give you the endorsement for the written exam, you're guaranteed to pass it. We've never had anybody fail the written exam. So definitely uh, check that out at flyatmikealpha.com. Uh, Rookie Pilot says, is it worth aiming for the big airlines or better to be a long-term CFI? Honestly, it's what makes you happy. That is the only thing as far as what's better to do. Um, you have to decide what makes you happy. Is it flying in little airplanes? Is it flying big airplanes? Does that make you happy? Do you like the schedule of the airlines? Do you like the schedule of being a CFI, being at home in your own bed? Or do you like hotels and traveling? Uh, do you like you know, how the airline industry is set up? Every 10, 15 years, they go through some tough times like they're going through right now. Things will get really better, a lot better. They'll be amazing for a while, and then they'll have some tough times, just kind of how they go. Uh, no one makes it through an airline career without, you know, a few bankruptcies, a merger or two, a furlough, and maybe a divorce. Um, that's just the typical path of your professional airline pilot. Um, it's still a great career. I would never dissuade people from doing it. I'd say become a CFI, build your time, go to the airlines. They'll hire, you know, in a year or two, they're going to start hiring again, probably a lot. And uh, just like they were before. And try it out. Try it out for six months a year. You don't like it? Quit. Go back to being a CFI. That's what I did. Uh, if you like it, stay. You know, it's a great place to be. It's a good career. So uh, either way, it works for you. Wig and Wolf. I'd save all money between ratings. Read the books, then train, earn the ratings, then fly when you can. That is the best way to do it, absolutely. Um, that is a really good way to do it. Uh, JD Jackson, best advice for rusty pilots. Well, JD, uh, you're in luck. Uh, Flat Mike Alpha, best advice for rusty pilots. If you want to learn a lot of stuff, go to the homepage there, click on free pilot courses, then click on the 2020 free private pilot ground school. Go through that whole course. It's free. You can just click on anything you want to learn about class, uh, GED airspace. You click on that lesson seven. It opens up. There's some videos. There you go. Class C airspace. You click on that one and then you click the video and you start watching it. So Lots of different stuff you can do. Once you do all of that in Lesson 7, there's even a little quiz that you can take. You can take the Lesson 7 quiz and see how you measure up if you're really absorbing everything you need to know about what you need to know, really. So that's one of your best bets. Next up, if you want the more advanced version, then you go Courses, Private Pilot Courses, and you go to the BFR slash Rusty Pilot Course, or Rusty Pilot slash BFR Prep Course. That course is narrowed down to exactly what you uh, may have forgotten, things that may have changed, knocking off some of the rust. Uh, all those different little topics are in there. 
ignore that. I've already signed up for the subscription list, of course. And then the flight review is in there also, a full uh, ground portion of a flight review and along with the full flight portion of your BFR, what that's going to look like. Uh, so if you're coming back to it as a rusty pilot, then uh, this is what you can expect right here. Uh, so that course, you can either buy the individual course or you access it with uh, the flight engineer membership or higher if you have a membership on the site, then it's included with uh, the flight engineer membership or higher on the site. Uh, the As far as you know, getting back into it right now, it is a good time to get back into it. I know some flight schools are closed still, whatever, but there's a lot of CFIs out there that are looking for work. The fuel is cheaper than we've ever seen it, really. Rental rates will come down. Uh, and everyone's looking for a hobby, you know, we have to social distance. What a better way to social distance than being at 5,000 feet over everybody else uh, flying your own airplane. So great time to get back into it. And uh, you can always check out basic med if you're worried about getting the medical. Um, but uh, definitely would uh, encourage you to get back in the air. Love to see people getting back in the air, JD. On that note, um, this airplane that we are basically destroying, right? So the one that we took all the oil out of, and ran until the engine seized so this thing um this airplane we're doing a lot of videos with we're slicing up the wings we're cutting into it uh we're going to tear it all apart show you guys uh all the inner workings of this airplane and you'll be able to see it you can see here like the valves running you know as we're turning it through we are destroying this airplane but an important thing here there are going to be still some usable parts on this airplane that are in fact airworthy. A lot of them will be cut open to explain and teach you guys how this airplane's put together. Other parts are going to be working still. Uh, I know somebody's coming down today to take the plastic trim panel from the overhead and also take the trim uh, handle and possibly the door handle off of it um, for their airplane. If you have a Cherokee airplane, all right, Cherokee 140, 180, whatever, a Piper product, and you could use some of the parts out of this airplane, all right, you can email us at cfiflightmikealpha.com or you can go here on the website to ask a question and fill out this little ask a question form and tell us what part you need. If we have it and it is in fact airworthy, we will then contact you. If you don't hear from us, it's because either that part is already gone or uh, it's not airworthy and we don't want to give it to you because we don't want you to get hurt. So uh, this is going to be on a need basis, right? So it's not first come first serve, it's as needed. It is if you own an airplane, and that airplane is flying, but it is not flying right now because you need a right main uh, landing gear strut. You need a stabilator. You need a trim handle. You need an oil pressure gauge, whatever it is, an attitude indicator, something. And we can provide that to you. It's free. It's no cost. We just ask you to pay for the shipping because we don't really want to go out of pocket here. Um, but we want these parts to be used to keep other airplanes flying. So if you own an airplane, now if you're building a project, well, that's kind of second priority. And if you want this to sit on your shelf because it's a pretty wall ornament, well, that's the lowest priority list, right? We want these parts to be used to keep other airplanes in the air. We're not charging for them. We just want you guys to pay for the shipping. Submit your request here through uh, the Ask Question tab or email us. And uh, that way this airplane not only educates you guys a little bit, you get to learn from it as we tear it all apart but it gets to live on in other people's airplanes. So it's uh, going to a good good use anyways. This thing is way too far gone to um, try to actually repair it and make it fly again, but uh, we would like to see it go to good use. So that being said, uh, moving back to other questions. Uh, Jorge says, can you give me the link? The link is really simple. It is flyatemikealpha.com, but uh, we'll go ahead and throw it in there for you, Jorge. Um, I'm 43, finished ground school. Would you recommend taking the medical exam before moving on to the written test and flight training? Yeah, it's not a bad idea. Uh, definitely, you know, go for a third class medical or even a first class medical. See how you stack up. If you have a known condition like you are diabetic or like you're on medication that you know is prohibited by the FAA, call up your AME first, your local AME, and say, hey, look, I'd like to get a medical exam. I don't want to go through MedExpress and actually apply for medical just yet. I'd like to come in for a consultation. Can you talk to me about the medications I'm on and these things? And go in and say, hey, I'm on this blood pressure medication. I'm on this. I'm on that, whatever. And the doctor will look at you and say, okay, well, we can't give you a medical because you're on this blood pressure medication. So here's what you need to do. You didn't apply for one, so I'm not denying you for one. So that's the key here. Don't apply for it because you don't want to get denied for it. Go in, talk to him. He'll say, you know, you're on Plavix, we need to replace that with XYZ. And he'll give you some different medications for you to go back to your family doctor and talk to him about and say, okay, uh, 
you know, I, I need to change out these meds and try some different ones. And then, hey, stay on those meds for a month or two. If everything's working out and you're good on those meds, those are FAA approved. And then come back, apply for the medical, and we can get you the medical certificate. You don't want to get denied for one, so it's a good idea if you're in doubt about something or you know there's an issue, then uh, to schedule that consultation first. Um, for the most part, you know, it, it's pretty lax. I mean, they're they're not going to be too strict. There's a few quirky things, you know, like heart conditions or diabetes. Um, but even people, you know, that have had cancer in the past, whatever, they get medicals all the time. So there's always workarounds. Just uh, be ready to call up that AME and work with them if, uh, if you think there's any hiccups in there. Uh, next up, uh, tips on learning to fly from the right seat. Will, uh, AV underscore Asian, great question. Best way to do it is to sit in the right seat and just watch somebody else fly. So if you got a buddy, uh, you're working on your CFI, he's working on his commercial, he wants to go out and practice some commercial maneuvers by himself, hop in there in the right seat, just sit there with him. And uh, maybe you can give him a little feedback, help him out a little bit. But most importantly, just sit there and burn that sight picture in your mind. Get used to sitting there, get some seat time over there. Then with your CFI sitting in the left seat and you sit in the right seat, you just got to go do it. You got to knock out those landings and burn that sight picture in your mind. Spend time taxing on center line and burning that sight picture into your mind what it looks like when you're on center line sitting in the right seat. All right, spend some time taxing around a couple miles around the airport. That is a big thing. Uh, other than that, it's just seat time. So anytime you can sit in the right seat, do so. Can you sit in the right seat when you're the only occupant of the aircraft? Absolutely. Is it smart if you don't have much experience in the right seat? Probably not. You probably want to have a CFI sit in the left seat with you or have a competent pilot in the left seat that can fly and land from the left seat with you just sitting there as a passenger. That's probably the best way to go about doing it. That's kind of how I did it. Uh, let's see here. And uh, can we ask beginner questions? Absolutely, Omar. I've been taking the online ground schools, but I can't really understand downwind slash upwind. Sure. So um, downwind is when you're flying with wind. Upwind is when you're flying against wind. That's a great way to explain it. Let's look at a map here of one of my very familiar airports. I've spent a lot of time here in Venice. Let's look at the sat view. And what we've got here is runway two, three. We got runway five going this way. All right. So what we really have is, if I go ahead and start drawing some stuff out, we take off, and as we're taking off, and we are going into the wind, right? Because we take off into the wind, against the wind, right? The wind is blowing from the water towards the land, and we're taking off from land towards the water because the wind's blowing this way. Well, guess what? We are upwind. We are fighting against the wind. All right, we come out here, and we go crosswind because now the wind is blowing across our path. And then we're downwind because now we have the wind on our tail, and then we are base and then we're a final, and you're saying, whoa, that's a pretty tight pattern. I'm like, yeah, well, that's why I like to fly when we fly these slow airplanes like Cubs and stuff. I like tight patterns where I can always make it back to the airport. Um, I hate those patterns that take us way out here. I don't like to fly the 20-mile final because if the engine quits, we'll never make it back. It's terrible. Um, so now the big question is, well, what happens when the wind's not blowing this way, but it's blowing a little bit this way? Well, we still call it upwind, crosswind, downwind, and base, and final. That's just how we refer to those legs of the traffic pattern always, because we assume in a perfect world that the wind would always blow right down the runway. We know it never does. That's okay. Sometimes the wind blows right across the runway. We still call them the same legs. And when the wind blows this way, well, if we were using runway 23, we would still call it the same legs. But obviously, if the wind's blowing from the east to the west, from the land to the water, well, you might want to consider using runway 5, taking off into the wind. Hopefully that answers it for you, Omar. If it doesn't, feel free to uh, elaborate on your question a little bit in the text below, and I'll try to address it a little bit better for you. Uh, let's see, what else do we have? Uh, do you recommend still flying with students and CFIs? Uh, Ricky, I'm assuming you mean as far as this whole COVID nonsense is concerned. You know, it's a personal thing, man. So if, um, if you've already had the virus and you're pretty immune to it, well, you're in pretty good shape. Uh, but again, you got to figure out if you're actually immune or not. Uh, if you're worried about getting the virus, if you're in a high risk group, maybe it's best not to. If you're in a very low risk group and you want to roll the dice, I know a lot of people out there do. A lot of people are like, hey, just give it to me now so I can get it over with and then I can be immune to it. Not that it always works out that way, but, you know, some people have that feeling, that sentiment. That's fine, you know. Bottom line is, if you have two consenting adults who want to get into an aircraft with each other, who am I to say no? 
are you going to get sick? Maybe that's on you. We all know the risks. We all know that, you know, there's a very small chance of actually getting sick and dying, but that if somebody else has the virus, that there's a very high probability that you will get the virus sitting in an airplane with them. And then of course, switching in and out of that airplane, people touch things, breathe on things, whatever. The virus spreads very easily. So got to make that personal choice, man. Um, obviously a lot easier if you own your own airplane and you know your CFI and you're limiting your contact with other people. Obviously a lot easier when you're in Alaska and not a single person in the entire town has the disease and everyone's been quarantined for more than 14 days, well, it's pretty obvious that everyone could logically interact and, and not be spreading the disease. So uh, what am I doing? Well, I'm still flying and doing flight training when it's considered essential and people uh, need um, you know, an instructor and also that I kind of know them and know where they've been and, you know, I'm pretty confident that I'm not going to get sick and I'm pretty confident actually I already was sick on the cruise ship that we were stuck on and we got over it. So hopefully I can't get sick again, hopefully. Um, but that's, uh, I don't know if that's what you're meaning, but that's uh, the best answer I can give you. Uh, Wigan Wolf, uh, are y'all going to rip the wings off too? Perhaps drop it from a certain height to see how hard landing before the nose fails, mains fail. Yes, I would love to do that. I don't have any friends with a helicopter that could lift it up for us, and I don't have any friends with a crane. Uh, we tried to round one up around the airport. Could not be. I would love to do a drop test on the airplane. Any other ideas you guys have for what we should do to zero some whiskey before it's totally garbage? Uh, leave that in the comments below here. Uh, type that in there. I'd love to hear some more ideas. Uh, we did do an electrical fire in it the other day and put that out, luckily. Um, but we're doing lots of fun videos in there. Uh, moving on here, we've got, don't see the written test prep course. Well, Jorge, it is built into the premium private pilot ground school. So it is this course right here, the premium private pilot ground school 2020. And all the written prep is built into that. We actually are releasing a private pilot written prep course that is just written prep kind of a shepherd error-esque style. It is just designed to kind of rote memorization, drive those answers into your mind, drive those concepts into your mind. It's not as in-depth as our premium private pilot ground school. It's really for the guys that are looking for a shorter version. This is a 40 to 50 hour course to get through this. Uh, our really private pilot boot camp that's going to be released here in about a week or so, that is about a three hour long course to go through that. Uh, and it is it, honestly, I mean, it's just rote memorization. Um, it's great if you want to just do that, if that's your thing. Uh, we're going to have the same thing for instrument and commercial pilot here by the end of May. Uh, do I feel super good about it? Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, if you guys want to do that, that's fine. I'd prefer you take this course and really learn some stuff. You'll learn a lot taking this course, and you'll pass your written exam, and you'll pass your written exam using the other thing. You just may not have a real fundamental understanding of some of those other concepts, but people like those products, and so, you know, that's how the marketplace works. You know, customer wants a product, we provide the product for them. Uh, commercial pilot, yes, uh, we'll have, like I said, we'll have those boot camps uh, by May. And then, of course, commercial pilot is all under the commercial pilot tab there, Jorge. You can click on that courses, commercial pilot, and there's several commercial pilot courses in there. Uh, Marcus, I may have missed it. Please uh, copy and paste it back in there for me uh, because I. Yeah, there, there's the feed as it keeps rolling. I do miss questions. So if I do miss your question, please, by all means, copy and paste it in there. You can ask it again. Uh, we are down to uh, IVK. I just got my CFI double I M E I. Congrats. That's a lot. And we're instructing for a month. Then we hit the shutdown. Would you recommend to stick to aviation or do a career change since we don't know when this will improve? Well, I would say stick with aviation. Obviously, you got a lot invested in it. And obviously, you got a lot of ratings, a lot of stuff on your resume. And so absolutely, I would stick with it. Does that mean I'm going to tell you don't go wait tables in the meantime? Do whatever you have to to pay your bills, you know? So if there is absolutely no flying around you, we well, you can consider moving to an area where there is flying. I know they're still doing lots of flight training here in Sarasota and Venice. They're still doing flight training in Alaska, uh, the two places I'm familiar with. And if they're not doing flight training by you and you have to supplement your income, drive an Uber or, you know, wait in tables or whatever, guess what? That's what we had to do back in 2012, 2013, 2014 for a lot of CFIs. And it's what we're going to have to do again for a few months here, you know, possibly six months, a year until things kind of smooth out. Um, but there is lots of students as far as uh, I can see, lots of people that want to go flying. So I would not recommend a career change. If you love aviation, stick with it. If you're bored of aviation, you want to go sell houses or do something else, that's fine too. Um, 
take this time, if nothing else, if you can't work at all, if there's no work available by you, if everything's shut down, take this time to add to your resume and take an online course to be certified as a real estate agent or take an online course to become a, a mediator, or take the online course to become a notary public or whatever. Do anything you can to improve yourself during this time. All right, the online courses, Red Flat Mike Alpha, are there for that to try to give people more knowledge during this time. Obviously, you've already got a lot of knowledge being a CFI, I, -I, MEI, but there's still more to learn. Take the seaplane course in Flight Mike Alpha. Um, you can also, you know, there's just a lot of different things you can do out there to try to build your resume, even outside of aviation, that might help you in aviation, right? It's always good to have a pilot on staff who's also a notary, right? Go ahead and do that for 150 bucks online. Um, anything you can do during this time to improve yourself, always a good opportunity. Yahal, boy, I'm not going to even attempt your last name because I would butcher it. I'm so sorry. Uh, excellent Q&A. Friend from France with full ATPL and commercial license would like to move to the U.S. to become a CFI. There is a good idea. And where would be the best state to build up ours? Well, probably Arizona, California, Florida. Um, best bets. Uh, obviously, I love Alaska. It's very pretty. But do you fly year-round there? Eh, not so much. Not with students, anyways. California, Arizona. Uh, New Mexico, anywhere in the south, southern United States, very busy, really great. Even parts of uh, out west like Utah, Salt Lake is busy for flight training right now. Bottom line is any of those places can be good. Look at ones that um, you are still going to have a market here in six months, which is going to be, you know, we'll have more international students coming in once travel restrictions relax, uh, like California and Florida. Um, we'll have locals coming back out. And look at a place you want to live where the cost of living is affordable, Uh and, yeah, I mean, obviously, if you go train people in San Francisco, getting a one-bedroom apartment there is crazy expensive compared to if you go to Salt Lake or Arizona or Phoenix, somewhere like that. So, uh, aviation, sure thing. Cole, how does load factor affect stall speed and time to turning? I understand it is total lift over total weight, but why does it increase stall speed? Great question, Cole. So, let's address that. How does load factor affect stall speed and time to turning? Well, we know that if we turn that we increase g-forces, right? Because as we increase our bank angle, we're gonna to go to a VG diagram. As we increase our bank angle, oh, that's the VG diagram we used in one of our videos. Uh, as we increase our bank angle, we increase the load factor on the airplane. Why is that? Well, if we go back to this, oh boy, this is gonna get messy because I do not have a pen here to draw this with. So let's go ahead and draw this with a brush tool. I'll make this as neat as possible, hopefully for you guys. Does that work? Nope, that didn't work at all. Let's change the color. Not very visible. Let's do that. All right, so uh, X, Y chart. That is not vertical lines at all. Wow, that's terrible. Um, maybe that's more vertical. Okay, so vectors, right? All right, we have a vector. So let's say we have this vector here. We can break that up into a horizontal and vertical vector. All right, so horizontal and vertical. If we have an airplane, by the way, what I'm drawing right now is an airplane. Just go with it. That's the wing, that's the tail, those are the weird landing gear. All right, I'm doing this with the mouse, it's terrible. That's our lift, okay, that's our vertical lift. If I tilt our airplane, okay, so now our airplane is tilted, and I tilt that lift. That lift can be broken into a vertical and horizontal component, okay? We always need this much, to keep the airplane level, one G force, right? So we always need one G. So since we're deflecting that vector, since we're turning it, well, now we actually have to make this one overall bigger because we need the same length one. This has to equal, that has to equal that, all right? So we have to make the total lift bigger. That's where the load factor comes from. We're making more lift on the wing because we're developing horizontal lift and vertical lift. We still need to develop the same amount of vertical lift to stay level. To do so, we need to increase total lift. This is total lift right here, okay? That arrow right there. I apologize for the terrible drawing. So that's total lift. So we've increased lift on the wing. So we're increasing our angle of attack. When we're doing that, increasing lift, well, it makes sense that if we're going to need to develop more lift, then we're going to need to go faster, right? So at one G-force, this particular airplane, 65 miles per hour can support one G-force, say 1,000 pounds is one G. If we need two G-forces because we're banking at 60 degrees, and that's you know our, our vector, basically, we draw the, the 60, 30, 90 triangle, we need two G-forces now. Well, in that case, 
I have to come up here and this graph tells me you're going to have to go 100 miles an hour to do that, okay, or 100 and something, you know, whatever, to be able to develop two g-forces. Thus, if I increase past that, say I increase to 70 degrees of bank, and now I'm trying to pull 2.5 g's, but I'm only going 100, well, we can see that 2.5 g's, that's not going to be enough at 100, and the airplane will stall. So that's an accelerated stall. This is our normal stall speed at 1 g when we just slow down and it stalls. This is, hey, if you try to support more weight on that wing, what if I just dropped, you know, a thousand pound weight on your airplane, just added a thousand pounds of sandbags as you're flying along there? Your airplane's going to start descending. You're going to pull back, increase your angle of attack, and try to develop more lift to maintain a little flight. Eventually, you're going to exceed the critical angle of attack, which happens right along this line. This is all exceeding the critical angle of attack, and that is what is increasing the stall speed. Hopefully, that makes sense. If it doesn't, Cole, then shoot me a message right down below there and I will explain it a little bit more. We'll try to wrap up here because we only got seven minutes left, guys. Opinions on home flight simulators like X-Plane. Absolutely awesome. X-Plane is great. Uh, X-Plane is like 50, 60 bucks. You can download it. Great program. Definitely get X-Plane. Uh, joystick. You can get a joystick. It is, what are they? Uh, 150, don't get that one. This one, that's fine, right? $22. Terrible reviews though. Uh, this one, oh, not so good reviews either. I guess they're all kind of crummy. Um, 60 bucks, right? So yeah, 20, 30, 60 bucks, something like that. Get a joystick. You really want the full yoke and pedals? That's even better, but not necessary if you're just trying to build your scan. All right, yoke and pedals looks like you're looking at about 250 bucks or so, 280 bucks for the complete set, right? Um, what is that total? It's going to be, yeah, 250 for the CH yoke and CH pedals. That's more realistic. That's all you really need. Uh, do you need fancy monitors or other fancy stuff? No, not really. Uh, you just need yoke and pedals or even just a simple joystick and X-Plane, and then you just need the computer to run it. It is a great tool to use for private instrument commercial, especially for instrument, especially, especially for instrument. Simulators are great. Uh, hello, Orson. FS9, sure, I prefer X-Plane, but that's okay. Um, yeah, pour zero some whiskey. Yeah, Sava, that thing. Uh, good times. Um... But uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's going to a better purpose now. It's going to educate thousands of people, tens of thousands of people of what is inside that airplane. We'll get all those videos posted here. Uh, a lot, lot more videos posted on Flight Mike Alpha with that airplane. Fly with a mask and practice sterile cockpit. Wash your hands. Don't touch your face. That's a good recommendation. That's certainly a good mitigating uh, way to mitigate you know, the spread of the virus. Washing your hands before you get in the airplane. And of course, washing when you get out. Wearing masks, all that stuff. All good. Uh... And Nick Jack, hey there, just got in. Where do we go to sign up for FA exam? And has COVID stopped tests for now? COVID has stopped some testing. You go to, you can just Google PSI FAA test and um, you'll go there, faa.psiexams.com. That is where you'll register for your exam. Uh, call your local testing center, see if they're still open. Some are open, some are closed. Uh, just kind of depends. Uh, if you already have the endorsement, then you can sign up and schedule your test on their website there. Uh, Jorge, yep, keep an eye out. We'll make an announcement once we get that live there for commercial pilot. Eduardo, John, I'm a private pilot and also an AIGI. Cool, my commercial check ride has been rescheduled nine times now. My question is, can I combine the commercial and CFI check ride? I already have my FI written to done as also. I don't believe that you can do that. Um, you can combine the private and instrument, although I think it's a terrible idea. I don't believe you can combine the commercial and the CFI, unfortunately. Plus, it's really just kind of impossible because the CFI check rides like eight hours anyways. So you're not going to want to make that any longer. Um, and you're just making it more difficult on yourself. It's okay to do the commercial ride and then two, three days later do the CFI ride, but you should do them as two separate check rides, really. I don't think there's a provision that would allow you to do it as two, um, you know, or those two combined up. Whew. Running out of breath there. All right. Um, I'm an inexper inexperienced, Marcus says, I'm an inexperienced private pilot. I got my private pilot in the States in 2017, but I haven't flown much since. I do love going on vacation in the U.S., and I would like to get some more flight hours in. Do you know of some good places in the U.S. to fly uh, for fun flying vacations? Well, depends on uh, who can rent you an airplane. I do know Angel Aviation, all right, Angel Aviation, Anchorage, Alaska, they rent out airplanes, 172s, 
very, I'm sure you're familiar with them. And they'll let you go fly around Alaska with their 172 with just, you know, an hour or two check out from one of their instructors. That's probably the most fun you could have. Other than that, Utah, super beautiful. Eastern Utah, go to Salt Lake City right in an airplane, fly around Utah, Arizona, Grand Canyon. Uh, out West, I just love. I think it's awesome. If you want a dose of seriously busy airspace, rent an airplane up in uh, New York, go fly down the Hudson River if cities are your thing. I'm not a big fan of cities, so yeah, flying down the Hudson really cool, but, you know, I have a lot more fun flying out in Alaska. Um, so yeah, things have slowed down a bit in Alaska with all this COVID stuff. So when you do have time, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of availability of rental airplanes, a lot of availability of hotels, tourism, cruise ships, all that stuff is really taking a hit this summer. So come to Alaska this summer, do some flying around there. I'll be up there. Uh, and, um, I could give you a renter checkout possibly, uh, depending on if I'm in Saldovia or Anchorage and yeah, I would highly recommend Alaska for a fun flying vacation to rent an airplane. Uh, and go do that. That would be a great place to go for it. Um, Marcus, uh, Florida is the mecca of general aviation. Yeah. Um, but that's flat and kind of boring. I mean, it's beautiful. I flew here for a long time. Florida is cool. I just, I'm, I like Alaska better now. Um, let's see what else here. Austin, your CFI. That's great. Marcus, thanks, Nick. And I guess I should just read these quietly to myself and then answer them, right? Wouldn't that make more sense? Hey, John, Darren here. I'm looking to get my PPL in the next year or so as a hobby. Do you recommend getting my instrument rating as well? I live in Colorado and intend to do some mountain flying eventually. Darren, highly recommend the instrument rating. Highly recommend you get hooked up with these guys called the RAF. All right, just Google um, RAF Recreational uh, Airstrip Foundation. I'm pretty sure I'm misspelling that. Recreational Airstrip Foundation, get hooked up with those guys. Really amazing dude out there that does mountain flying seminars. And why is his name escaped me right now? He's based around Denver. Super cool dude. He's got some videos on YouTube. Um, Backcountry seminars, uh, Colorado. Just so you know, Colorado is probably some of the most intimidating mountain flying in the country, even way more so than Alaska. The Colorado Plateau probably one of the most deadly places you can go fly. Not to be afraid of it. It is totally safe to go fly there. A lot of people have flown through there. Um, totally fine. But what I'm saying is crucial, crucial, crucial to get proper training. I don't know if it's Colorado Mountain School is his website, but there's a couple of them. I believe this might be him. Um, probably not. Let's try somewhere else. Um, man, backcountry flying would really help. I guess I should learn how to Google better. Um, backcountrypilot.org, might, this might be him. Um, or at least they've got a link to it. I'll find that for you. Email me and I'll find you his name. And it really is driving me up the wall. I can't remember it right now, but he is an awesome dude, really involved with the RAF. If you look at the RAF uh, for uh, RAF airstrip, if you look at them, for their uh, state liaisons, you will find his name in there. And uh, super great resource. He's just eager to get out there and, and get more guys flying like yourself. But instrument rating is crucial because the weather changes like crazy out there. Really help build your skills. Um, definitely get good, good mountain flying instruction uh, if you're flying around Colorado and going through those mountain passes. Uh, let's see what else. And... Uh, but uh, definitely go for it, Darren. It's exciting to hear anybody who wants to get into flying in Colorado. It's a beautiful place. Oh, my gosh. Colorado Plateau, Eastern Utah. Super beautiful. I love it out there. Um, I don't understand density altitude. I always get the wrong answer. Okay, Veronica. Cool. That's uh, all right. Let's see here. For uh, We'll do this as our last one. We'll see if we can find... Actually, Veronica, I'm so sorry. It's already 1 o'clock. Um, we will do this because I don't have my camera with me right now. We'll do this next week. I will walk you through how to use that E6B. In the meantime, uh, this may help you. We'll go fly MA E6B and uh, density altitude, this video right here. I'll share this link with you and see if this can help you out, uh, Veronica. That should uh, be a good explanation for you. And, uh, yeah, RAF, Royal Air Force, I know, right? But it's here in the States, it's the Recreational Airstrip Foundation. Uh, so, uh, I think that's going to wrap it up for us um, right now. Can you combine, last one I'll try to take, uh, take here is Prince. Can you combine cross-country requirements for IFR to meet 
commercial ongoing XC commercial requirements. Huh. Um, you can sort of, but when you read the reg, really, the 250 needs to be solo. Um, so when you get into that, if you look in 61, uh, 189, I want to say it is possibly, or no, it's an instructor reg, 61, 129. Um, let me pull it up here. I don't think you're going to be able to combine them because aeronautical experience for commercial pilots, you need the long cross country is what you're talking about. Um, and this has to be done. See, 10 hours of solo flight time in a single engine airplane or performing duties above uh, whatever. Uh, so it doesn't quite work. And this also falls under for four airplane single engine rating. When you read this, I don't want to waste too much of your time, but I'm going to say no because uh, the way this is worded, and I can give you a better explanation. If you email us any other questions, guys, flyatmikealpha.com, click the Ask a Question tab, fill out this form, it'll email us, and I will get back to you either next week or via email. Um, so, any other questions? Oh, excuse me. It's time to end this thing. Put them there on flyatmikealpha.com, and we will see you guys next week. Be sure to check out the YouTube channel. Lots of videos coming out this summer. We have actually two videos, two to three videos per week coming out every single week this summer ongoing. Uh, so definitely check that out. And we'll see you guys in the next one. Before I go, I just have to do this because it's my favorite thing ever. I have to show you the uh, flying out there in eastern Utah. If I can find it here quickly. Where is it? Maybe there. No. 400 cannon. We'll do that next week. Uh, we will find the uh, drone footage from flying out west there. It's Ohio to Texas. I know it's in here. Oh, it's all that. Man. Yeah, that's going to be forever to download because it's on Dropbox. Next week, we'll show you uh, some of that drone footage. It is so beautiful out there. Um, and really encourage you guys, if you ever have the opportunity to go out west, go flying. In the meantime, can't fly every day. Fly at MikeHelf.com. We will see you guys next week. Same time, noon. As long as we are on lockdown, we will be here. Look forward to seeing you next week. Cheers.